Uh, I want to talk about this topic, afraid to assemble, starting in Acts 4. And here's where uh, it's coming from, uh, if I may uh, talk a little bit about it. There, you know, we have had in place from uh, the governor a decree that uh, all, you know, religious services will be allowed to continue. Uh, but that wasn't always the case. Early in this COVID-19 crisis, uh, the city of Austin, the mayor of Austin forbade, expressly forbade churches to assemble. Um, and we assembled anyway. Uh, but the thing about that that I realized, uh, especially in retrospect, is that, you know, leading up to the time in study and in discussion, I, I was seeing it, it's pretty clear in the scriptures that uh, on the one hand, people don't have to assemble when they are ill, certainly, and even when they are in you know, serious danger of illness or they have people in their care who are in serious danger, there, there cannot be any guilt or any fault for people staying away in this time of crisis in the nation. On the other hand, those who are well and who are able and don't have this, these kinds of dependents uh, at home or in their regular interactions, we still have a commandment to meet. So if you can do so, then you do, and if you can't, then, then you don't, and there's no guilt. But it seemed very clear to me that, well, we, we really, you know, I have no reason why I can't assemble. I'm not going anywhere. I'm able to work from home, and I have no elderly people at home, no, uh, you know, serious illnesses, thanks be to God, at home, no, no diabetes or heart disease or immunodeficiency or anything like that where I have to be very concerned. So I have no reason why I shouldn't go. So I'm going to go. And that seemed very clear. Um, but then, you know, <laughs> As the, as the hour drew near, like Sunday morning came around, I realized I was actually very agitated about this, very afraid of what was going to happen. Because um, I started to think, well, it's, you know, Satan can easily take advantage of this situation. <laughs> if he's been looking for a way to get the church, well, he's got one now. And, um, you know, the police station's not far from here. And, you know, we can't get them to come out here when we have a problem and we need them. But they would, you know, it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> uh, and so I started thinking about, well, am I ready to go to jail today? You know, and uh, can I, they, they probably don't let me work from there. Like, I'm sure they don't have a business center like the hotels do, let you go log in to work uh, and telecommute. I'm pretty sure they don't do that. And I thought, well, who's going to, you know, <laughs> who's going to pay our bills if I'm in jail? You know, who's going to take care of my family if I'm in jail? And, you know, and then on the other hand, people would say, well, you know, uh, uh, that's not likely to happen. I'm like, well, maybe not. Uh, or, you know. That's not right. That's not legal. I'm like, well, I agree with you. The Constitution guarantees our freedom to assemble and our freedom of religion. That doesn't mean that the city of Austin won't break it or do something that is illegal and incarcerate people. Uh, that certainly has already happened in other places. There are definitely ministers who were incarcerated on Sunday morning. Um, so, uh, as I thought through that, it was actually very scary. I thought, well, you know, I don't know how well off everybody here is, and we don't have a lot of, uh, like, everybody's not able to come, so the contribution's probably pretty low, and, you know, if I end up in jail, how long is it going to be before we win the court case that releases me, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I'm sure we would win because this is unconstitutional, but how long would that take? <laughs> And how many bad things have to happen to you while you're incarcerated and whatever else. And 
uh, the, the lost wages and all that kind of stuff. So it was frightening, as I realized, is, yeah, this is actually very scary. So what seems clear, uh, you know, becomes a very frightening prospect when it gets down to it. And that's the thing that I wanted to talk about. Um, the fact is that sometimes uh, we do know what's right, but it doesn't make it any easier to do it. <laughs> that's what we're saying. It still can be a, a scary idea. So here in Acts 4, I've started because this is one of the first places where you see them getting in trouble with the law. <clears throat> now, the law was not right. The law was not just, if you will. These Pharisees and Sadducees who are running Jerusalem, they're not right in what they're doing. This is against the law. And it's against the law of Moses, as Paul would point out to them when they commanded him to be struck. Uh, but that doesn't matter, and that doesn't stop it from happening, at least in the short term. So the, the apostles are speaking to the people, and the priests and captain of the temple, the Sadducees, came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. But this is greatly annoying to them. They don't like this idea, and there's lots of reasons for this from a civics point of view. But it says they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. So we know that these apostles actually did go to jail and they spent the night in jail. And I have to think jail is not pleasant anywhere in the world, um, in Jerusalem or anywhere else. That's just not a good thing. But then the next day they bring them for inquisition, the seventh through the 10th verses, set them in the middle of the, the council here, the circle, and began the inquiry. By what power or by what name did you do this? So it's like, what gives you the right? We have the power. You know, we have the right. That's what they're saying. That's not true. But that's what they're saying. And so it's an example to us that things don't always go right. Things don't always go just. They don't always follow the rules, even their own rules. So you have to think about this and be ready for this. But Peter, filled with the Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today about a good deed done to a crippled man regarding how he has been healed, well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Well, it's interesting to me to see that they, immediately on answering or giving, being given a chance to speak about this, they immediately are about the fact that Jesus is what this is about and always has been. They are not saying, hey, you did the wrong thing, or, you know, my rights were violated, uh, or, you know, I want a lawyer. You know, <laughs> they weren't doing that. They just took this chance on the record to say, Jesus is the reason for the thing that has happened. Is that what you're asking about? And so it goes down to the, it's not about what were they doing, or who are they, or what gives them the right it's completely selfless, their answer. And it focuses very much on the mission, which is the teaching of Jesus and the rightness of Jesus. Now, they've wronged Jesus, so they don't want him to be right. Because <laughs> that means that they have been wrong and very wrong. And most people are just not comfortable with that. But we're all of us wrong, and we all have to repent, and we all have to admit that we've been wrong and come to God. But you can understand that's hard. But the apostles have taken that chance, and that's good. They did right in this, but that's not easy. In the 18th verse later, they, you know, they conferred, well, what are we going to do about these guys? And they called them back and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. So it's censorship. Don't do, you will not do this. You won't speak in his name. Peter and John answered, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. 
So first thing is, do they have to listen to the authority of the local government or do they have to listen to the authority of God? Which one is the right thing? You must judge. You got to make a decision here. But we cannot, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. All he's saying is, hey man, we're just being honest. This is what happened. This is what we have seen and what we have heard. This is what God has done and what he has told us. That's it. We're just being honest. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. Now, they further threatened them. First they said, no more speaking or teaching in the name of Jesus at all. And the apostles said, well, you decide whether we should obey that or not. And it says they further threatened them. Well, you know, this probably means, you know, whatever punishments or fines, uh, perhaps um, something to their families or whatever else it might be. And it shouldn't be overlooked that those are real things and those are frightening things. Now, they went on and they did what was right and taught what was right anyway, which is, you know, which is the thing. They, they prayed and, and God blessed them and they went about and preached boldly, which is good and which we know because we have today the scriptures. Now I'm going to move to Hebrews 12, and there's this as well, which also, um, to our point, reads very easily, but it's not so easy to live, right? You read what they did in Acts 4, and you see how they were daring and bold to do the right thing. But it's, the reality of that is that it's still a terrifying thing to do. Now here in Hebrews 12, in 3 through 6, the same thing. Consider him who endured from himself such hostility, or I'm sorry, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And that's a reminder that, yeah, we haven't resisted to the point of shedding blood. Now some people have. That has happened before, and it could happen, uh, but this is just a reminder that Jesus endured hostility against himself, and he, he died. He was, you know, very horribly treated, um, really throughout his time of teaching on earth at the end there, the last three, three and a half years of that. He taught, and you know, some people received him well, but some people did not. And the authorities were not fair with him. And you know, the way he was received and the way he was treated was not good. The uh, rejection, the denials, uh, there's all kinds of abuse, uh, if you will, um, prior to the crucifixion. And then the crucifixion itself is, in, is a long um, and agonizing, torturous death which Jesus endured against himself, which is a struggle against sin. He did this to be the offering for us that we might have forgiveness. Now, when he says this, he doesn't mean to shame us. He's just saying, you got to think about this. Don't grow weary or faint-hearted. You know, remember to stay the course, that sometimes the course is costly. So it's the same as Acts 4. We can see that what's being said makes perfect sense and is clearly the right thing to do. But it's hard to do. It's, it's a difficult thing. And, and here the encouragement is to stay the course and to count the cost. You know that this could happen. 
And it could come to this. And you say to yourself, well, I know what I would do, but it's different to say what you would do if it were to happen and to see what you actually do when it does happen. Those are different things. In Hebrews 12, three through six continues, have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. What he's saying here is sometimes bad things happen and they're not just, but they're useful. They're discipline and they make us stronger, even though they don't seem pleasant for the time. In the end, it yields peaceable fruit of righteousness. But it's like discipline. Don't regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Don't be weary when reproved by him. It, it's just getting at the idea that, yeah, we are suffering sometimes. And really, if you do the analysis on this passage that's being quoted, it, it's going back to the wandering in the wilderness, saying they were allowed to be tempted. They were allowed to be hungry so that they would know that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from God's mouth. So they would learn to trust in God. He let them suffer some. And so it is here. Sometimes bad things happen. And sometimes we need that. That discipline is useful to us, even though it seems unpleasant for the time. The Lord disciplines the one he loves. The Lord chastises every son he receives. So when he loves us, then discipline happens. There, there are things in life that are hard or that are trying or that are unjust that we suffer. And it's so that we learn endurance. It's so that we hang on, so that we get stronger. Then we'll go over to 2 Timothy 4. Now here, the apostle that we know and maybe even associate most often with prison is Paul. I always remember that conversation with my friend at the university, the, one of the professors. We were talking. He was getting a little agitated with my insistence on the scriptures. And even though he himself is somebody that you know, very sincerely believes that they're true. And uh, he said, well, here's my issue. You know, all these people, these other professors around me, they're so smart, they're so intelligent, and none of them accept this book. Um, you know, he said, I, I don't understand that. And I, I just said, well, Paul told us, you know, this God has made the wise be foolish. And the wisdom of God seems like foolishness to men. And and his response to me was, that guy spent too much time in prison. I always remember that conversation. And I thought, wow, that's very discouraging <laughs> if that's your view of the, the influence on Paul's writing. That's very discouraging. So I could see how he would feel and how that was frustrating to that, that, my friend. But um, here... What we're really seeing from Paul is rather the opposite. At my first offense, 2 Timothy 4, 16 to 17. At my first offense, and we mean his first you know, appearance in court, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed. As he says, the first time I've had to take my stand, no one came to stand by me, all deserted me. So he went to court and none of the Christians showed up. Nobody was there with him. Which is like Jesus, who also was subjected to these false trials before the high priest and before Pontius Pilate, with no witnesses to help him, nobody to stand by his side. He was forsaken and left all alone. And as he says, may it not be charged against them. I think what the apostle is saying here deserves some serious consideration. He knows that it's very hard to do that and that people who know better don't always do better. And so his prayer for them is that it may not be charged against them. 
they'll have another chance, is what's implied, isn't it? They'll have another chance to be brave for God. And that's what his prayer is. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. So we're never really alone. The Lord is with us, even if we suffer. And we need to endure it for patience sake, for discipline's sake. And that can be a hard thing. So counting the cost is uh, a very reasonable approach to this. But what the apostle says, I think, deserves serious consideration. May it not be charged against them. I would caution us, you know, against finding fault. Um, yes, I think the scriptures are very plain that we are to assemble, and people should be doing so if they can do so. Again, Nobody should assemble who is not well or who has others in their care that they depend upon uh, that are in a bad way. You know, there's no need for you to feel obligated to subject them to that risk. Um, however, if you're well, if your conditions and your situation allow you to assemble, I don't see why you wouldn't. And yet, we have to have this attitude as that Paul had as well. That, yeah, that is nonetheless a very difficult proposition. So probably more patience, more kindness is warranted. Uh, you know, I don't want to wear our assembling as a badge of honor or uh, to point to that and say, well, this means that we are better than the other congregations um, who have not been assembling. And I don't know whether they're assembled today or not. But uh, because that's very hard to know what their situation is or what they're doing. I wouldn't do that. Uh, and it's not as if there aren't clear indications of the difference anyway. You don't really need this. This is such a difficult and controversial thing. I wouldn't camp on this. I would just go back to the Bible and point out how they're not doing that. That seems pretty clear. But the other thing that Paul does here is say, I was rescued in this way from the lion's mouth. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth, which is to say, this is how it happened. Even though nobody stood by me on the first time around, I don't want that to be charged against them. And the Lord was with me, and I was delivered from the lion's mouth, which is a reference, a clear reference to Daniel. And the thing that I want to point out with Daniel, and I don't want to take all the time that I originally had planned to flesh out what happened to Daniel. But I will point out one thing in Daniel 6, verses 9 through 11. King Darius signed a document, an injunction, that forbade the prayer to God and the worship of God in any way for 30 days. Daniel knew the document had been signed, meaning he was aware that this thing existed and that it was going before the king. And he was aware that when the king signed it, it was the force of law. That is the law. When he knew that, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem, which apparently is what he always did. He had a house. He had a, a, you know, the place where he actually lived and ate had windows, and they were open towards Jerusalem. When we say this, what we mean is it's in plain sight. Everybody can see that the windows are open towards Jerusalem. And what did he do? Well, he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Which is an interesting thing to me. The reason for looking at Daniel, well, besides the fact that Paul pointed us there, I think what he's doing there is subtle but very important. Um, by what Paul's doing is subtle but very important in pointing us to Daniel. Because what Daniel's doing is exactly what he had been doing before, unchanged. 
I think the the lesson here with Daniel is that if you look at the specifics of this, uh, there was no requirement that you pray, you know, visibly uh, in public. There was no requirement that you pray from upstairs with your windows open where everybody can see you doing it. There was no requirement that you pray at specific times, three times every day. You can't find any of those things. But those were the, that was the order that he had established for his own practice and his own belief in God, and that's how he did things. And it was how he always did things. On the one hand, you would look at it and say, well, Daniel, you didn't have to do this, you know. You could have avoided arrest by praying privately. Just, you know, close the windows and pray instead. But that's not really right. Because that's letting the that's letting the, the, the injunction win, if you will. It's silencing the true child of God and silencing the work of God that needs to be done. And, and, you know, that's not really good. Even though he doesn't have to pray this way, it's what he had always been doing. So any change to that was going to be a, a change of the perception of how things were, of where the power really lies. Now, it's one thing when we're concerned about our own uh, assembly, our own health, the uh, logistics of coming together. I get it. You know, sometimes the weather uh, can be very serious. And in this case, we have COVID-19. That's a very serious thing. I don't see any issue with us having changed our schedule um, and changed some of the procedures here to accommodate those things. That's not, the, that's not a concern. But we do have to think about why would you change whatever it is that you'd change when Daniel continued to do what he had done previously, whatever that was? Even though it might have seemed like it was not necessary, it wasn't required, it was how he did things. And it was perfectly acceptable. I mean, it's the same thing here. We don't have to meet at 930, but we do. <laughs> and there's no reason not to. Um, or whatever else it might be in life, you know. We got to have enough uh, boldness that we're not hiding and we're not compromising with God. Even while we do the best that we can to abide by the laws and be subject to governing authority and show proper respect and thanksgiving as well. Of course, they had thrown Daniel into the lion's den, and the lions did not take him. And we find in the end of the 23rd verse, Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. God delivered him, even though he was alone and there all night. So it really brings together the different accounts of incarceration in the book of Acts. Kind of subtle what Paul's doing, but pretty good. The other thing that's happening in Daniel 6, if you do a closer reading there, is it's a type of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. They put a stone on the top and they even sealed it with a king's signet. But we'll let that one be what it is. Again, I think the larger point is what we've said. May it not be charged against them. The fact is, it's, it's sometimes very scary to serve God. It's sometimes very scary, the prospects of, of what might happen today or what might happen if I... And we've got to find the wherewithal to stand. I think some of that comes from thinking about it ahead of time and counting the cost. Some of that comes from reading these examples of how others were able to accomplish this feat. And remember, too, that this Peter who took the lead in Acts 4 is the same Peter who denied Jesus on the night of his betrayal, who was not present 
at that trial and didn't stand by his side. As Paul said, may it not be charged against them. And even Jesus said, Father, do not charge them with this sin. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, we got to take something from that that we can accomplish this through faith and through growth in the Lord. And we got to pray for each other in this regard. If today you're not a child of God, become a child of God. Um, you got to be more afraid of God than of man. Had to be more afraid of God and the consequences of eternity than whatever is happening here on earth. It won't be worth it if you trade comfort here or if you trade heaven for comfort here. That's not going to be worth it. If today we can help you to obey the gospel, we're glad to help you. If today you're a Christian and you've not been living right, well, it's time to repent and make things right with God and ask uh, him for forgiveness in prayer in, in your heart. In addition to, we are willing to pray with you and for you that you might be restored to him. None of us here is above sin, and uh, we all need forgiveness from time to time. So let's encourage one another while it is still day. If we can help you to obey the gospel, if we can help you uh, as a Christian to be restored to him, let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand, while we sing the song selected. <laughs>